This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our speaker series today. It's the 18th of June, and we're here with Chris. Chris is a principal software architect for Salesforce, Salesforce's Commerce Cloud. He used his more than 20 years of experience in developing high-scale software to help him and his team build and operate more than 9,000 websites in the cloud for some of the world's largest brands. Prior to Salesforce, Chris was chief software architect for Sophos Central Security Group, where he built security solutions that protect businesses. Chris is a Canadian Queens venturer and has been both a longtime Cub Master and now a Scout Master in Reading, Massachusetts. So without further ado, here's Chris Bourne. How are you today? Thanks for coming in and doing this. Hey, no problem, Chuck. Um, hey guys, um, don't know uh, how much you guys know about software please feel absolutely free to stop me as you go and ask questions. Um, I, I really don't mind being interrupted. Um, as Chuck said, uh, I'm a principal software architect um, for uh, Salesforce. Um, I work on a product called Commerce Cloud. Um, what is Commerce? Ah, of course, it reloads as soon as I go to it. Um, you didn't make this software. <laughs> Thinking about loading. There we go. Uh, so what is Commerce Cloud? Commerce Cloud is what we call a platform for building e-commerce sites. So imagine, if you will, that there's all these uh, brands out there, all, the, all these brands that you know the names of. We, we run some of the world's most famous brands. Uh, and they come and you know, they're really great at selling and, and making things that people wanna buy, but what they're not really great at necessarily is technology. And so they come to our company and we help them by giving them a platform on which they build all their sites. And so two examples here, uh, J. Crew I worked with last year, uh, J. Crew came to us and said, we really want to have an awesome e-commerce site. We want to be able to sell our clothing online, but you know, we're not really super adept at technology. Can you guys help us? And so we worked very closely with them. And today, uh, J. Crew, uh, they launched uh, just before Black Friday. Uh, Black Friday is the day that uh, is the number one retail day in the United States. Um, they launched just ahead of that and had their best Black Friday sales ever online uh, running on our platform. And so we strive to build uh, scalable, fast technology that's easy for the, our customers to use so that they can build brands for themselves. We power mobile devices. We power websites. Uh, we even power things that we call like embedded commerce. So if you've ever like done Alexa shopping and, and said, Alexa, order me this or Alexa, order me that um that's the one of the things that we offer uh facebook ads uh, uh whatsapp being able to buy through whatsapp th these are all things that we help our customers be able to do um so we create these flexible storefronts and then we take care of all the hard heavy lifting of scaling the machines and so my job is to design how this is all going to work so what's that kind of like really it's kind of like I'm an architect for malls. Um, so, you know, you go to like a, a regular mall and they've pre-built all these storefronts, but they're different sizes for different kinds of businesses. And, you know, if, if you look uh, at sort of the modern way that we're doing these open air village malls, like if you've been to any of the more recent ones around where they, they take a big land area and there's all these little stores, um, the way that these things get designed and architected by, by people physically is they think about the businesses that are gonna use these spaces and then they build some sizes and shapes that make sense for those businesses. And then the individual companies move in and they put up all the branding to make it their own, but they're really using all the infrastructure that was created by the architects. And so this is sort of what I do from a, uh, a, a technological perspective we create cloud-based spots where companies can come and build their storefronts. Um, what, it, what do we look like? We're really huge. We run like 9,000 of the world sites. You might see a bunch of brand names on here that you recognize. Um, 
we are deployed in over 84 countries worldwide. Uh, so we, we are all over the place. Um, we transacted last year more than $40 billion worth of sales on our platform. Um, so just a huge platform and we're the fastest growing commerce platform in the enterprise space. Um, so, you know, we are growing fast and, and furious. Um, sets of customers that you might recognize, um, you know, uh, being scouts, you might recognize Under Armour, GoPro, Adidas, uh, you might recognize um, uh, Columbia up here, uh, Vineyard Vines, Lacoste, there's, there's a huge number of, of high-end brands. We, we really specialize in the high-end as well. So people that you've heard of generally run their sites on us. Um, we also have a big uh, artificial intelligence division. The artificial intelligence division in Cambridge spends most of its time trying to think of new ways to build mach machine learning to help sell better. And so, as you can see, uh, last holiday season, we had over 164 billion recommendations where we said, hey, you were looking at this product, but this one might be something that you'd like too. Um, over the holidays, um, we had 3.9 billion shoppers come to our sites and uh, we're rapidly approaching 1 billion monthly visitors just at a regular cadence. Um, and over the holidays last year, just just between Thanksgiving and New Year's Day, uh, almost $11 billion uh, were transacted on the platform. So what about me? What do I do? Who am I? Um, my job's to help these both help our internal teams and help our customers build these e-commerce sites. Sometimes I'm working with uh, teams like I did with J.Crew. Uh, where I'm talking to J. Cruz programmers and trying to help them uh, do a better job, understand how to scale things better, how to deal with special uh, situations like sometimes people do things like shopping robots and shopping robots turn out to be a real problem for us because you get all these, these robots who just scan your website, look for when your prices go down on a sale and they try and snatch up everything that's on sale and then they try and resell it on eBay for a profit aftermarket. And that sort of hurts the reputation of the, the retailer when we do that. So I'll spend time trying to help them with different strategies for how we prevent them. Um, recently, Disney.com, uh, we had a problem on May the 4th where bots were attacking us, trying to suck up all of the special Disney merchandising for May the 4th. Um, and so we, we had to deploy countermeasures in order to help combat that. Um, other times I'm working with our internal teams. How fast is it to press that checkout button? Well, there's a lot of work that goes behind making sure that that experience is really smooth and easy and that it doesn't fail very much and that if uh, prevent things like oversells, like if you put something in your cart and you go and try and check out with it, you expect that you're going to be able to get it. And so it's actually kind of hard to figure out is there really that pair of shoes in stock that you wanted to buy? Or did someone miscount in the inventory? Did something fall off of a forklift or did something get pulled off a shelf and get put back on a wrong shelf and it's lost? We have to deal with all kinds of weird situations where it's not just as straightforward as yes, we have it or no, we don't. It's We're not sure if we have it, we have to go figure it out. Um, my job's uh, a software architect, um, so that means I started out as a programmer um, and I became pretty senior. Um, Salesforce employs uh, a total, uh, so we employ a total of 12,000 programmers. Um, and for those 12,000 programmers, there's about 50 of us that do my job and, and work with those teams. Um, so we sort of have progressive levels and we'll talk about that a little bit as we go. Um, but my job tends to be more about trying to coordinate programmers who are trying to achieve, uh, uh, achieve a, a goal. Um, my job involves a lot of learning. Everything about being a programmer is learning new technology. About every five years, half of all the technology becomes obsolete. And so every five years, I got to 
push half of what I know out of my brain and bring in another half. So you're constantly reading and learning and trying new things. Um, I also spend a lot of time uh, trying to influence people. I don't want to be that person who's a boss and is telling you what to do. I want to be the person who's giving you advice and helping you make your own decisions because people who feel empowered make better decisions. Um, I spend a lot of time um, applying some of the leadership skills that I learned. Uh, I was a venture crew president. I was a patrol leader. Um, I learned a lot about leadership before I ever came to my professional career. And I owe a lot of that to scouts. Um, what does a career path look like for someone like me? Um, I started out uh, 25 years ago now. <laughs> Um, I, I went and got a bachelor in computer science. I'm Canadian. I was living in Nova Scotia um, and I went to Acadia University. Um, I went into a program that highly valued internships and apprenticeship. And so uh, I did multiple internships. I interned uh, with the communications security establishment. Uh, that's kind of like the NSA, um, Canada's version of the NSA. Um, I worked for Nortel. Nortel is kind of like a, an AT&T kind of company uh, in Canada. They make, uh, they were at the time, they made uh, long haul network switching. And so I actually built some of the equipment that was used in Sprint's cross USA network. Um, and then I worked for a startup uh, called Quicklink Systems that built um, uh, <laughs> kind of dated now video rental software. Uh, and and point of sale software for stores so that like you could go into a convenience store and uh, all all of the computers that would work in the convenience store would be hooked up to our software. Um, when I moved to Massachusetts, I worked for a startup called Opticom. Uh, we were making uh, software that helped plan um, how to route network traffic and how to optimize network traffic. Um, we actually got a thank you note uh, after 9-11 because uh, Verizon had used our software in order to route traffic away from Manhattan and it had helped them with their response to 9-11. And so that was kind of a, a cool personal moment to, to get that thank you note from the Verizon executives. Um, in 2002, I moved to a company called Relicor. I kind of grew in seniority there, became a, a team leader so I started out as a senior software engineer there and, and transitioned to what we call a principal software engineer. A principal of software engineer is usually the leader of a small team, five to seven people. Um, from there, Relicor got acquired by a company called Symantec. Symantec makes uh, Norton Antivirus is probably their most famous product. Uh, while I was there, it was the same team from Relicor. We, we were acquired, so the, Symantec bought the company. Um, and uh, I became a development manager. I got a lot of leadership training there and a lot of the leadership training I got there sort of reminded me and, and brought me back to my scout days. A lot of the same things that you see at NYLT, uh, the, the leadership training program at Symantec did a lot of those same things. Um, from there, I was a director of engineering uh, at a little company called Lumagent that did database auditing. Um, I didn't stay at Lumagent very long. It wasn't a very uh, big company. It wasn't terribly stable. I did a, uh, a stint consulting for a group of power systems engineers for ISO New England. We were optimizing how electricity flows around the grid. It was kind of a cool and interesting uh, consulting job that I did for about six, seven months. Um, then uh, with the people that I worked at Nets, we ended up founding um, a, a secure instant messaging company called Zipter. And I was uh, founder and VP of engineering that for, uh, for about three years. We went through a series A and eventually uh, the team at Zipter was uh, aqua hired uh, into Sophos where I became the chief architect of their cloud security division. Um, I stayed there for about five years. That was a, that was a crazy fun place. Um, it was uh, a European company, so I spent a lot of time traveling around uh, to different European uh, cities, working with teams in lots of different areas as we transformed the company from an old fashioned, what we call enterprise software company, where we ship you software and you run the software, and we turned it into 
a SaaS business where we ran security software in the cloud and your data just was fed to us and we made decisions about what was going on in your network and pushed corrective actions out. Um, and then about uh, two and a half years ago, I moved uh, from there to Salesforce to Commerce Cloud to, uh, to help them scale out their business um, to where, where it is today. Um, so what are the key skills that, that make up make me successful at my job? Uh, high scale systems engineering has been the one thing that's been a theme. I was doing it at Symantec. I was doing it at Opticom all the way back then. I Sophos, it, it moved to Internet of Things scale. Um, we had 10 million connected computers uh, feeding us uh, data all the time um, to now Commerce Cloud is probably the number one, or not probably, it is the number one largest hosted uh, platform for e-commerce. Um, I know a lot about public cloud infrastructure, so I, I know a lot about Amazon and Google and, and how to use them in order to build new products. Um, I know quite a bit about performance engineering, getting every last, uh, every last millisecond squeezed out of the system for highly performance systems. Um, I spent a lot of time managing engineers and learning about how to do effective management. Uh, I know a lot about quality practices, making sure that the code that you uh, are creating is really good. And you'll notice that at the bottom of my list is programming. Uh, so programming was the thing that was fun and got me started in my career. But really these days I find I don't get, mostly I review other people's code or I just write quick little things that amuse me and keep me connected. But mostly as I've grown in my career, the programming part of my job has become less and less till I, I don't do a ton of programming anymore. Um, what did my education look like? Bachelor of Computer Science with Honors. Um, so that is uh, a bachelor's degree plus uh, a minimum of four internships, uh, plus a minimum GPA of 3.2 out of four, uh, plus a undergraduate thesis. Um, so I had to write uh, a semester long uh, thesis, which a thesis is effectively a whole book that you write on a topic in computer science. Your thesis is research and then the phases of requirements, design documents, test plans, and the actual program that you write, and then the presentation of all of it. Um, I like to choose my jobs primarily based on what I think I can learn and who I think I can work with and learn from. Um, I don't like to pick jobs based on how much money am I going to make at this or, or you know, am I going to get to do the same thing that I already like to do. I like to pick jobs where I'm going to push myself a little bit outside my comfort zone and do something new and, and thoughtful. What, is it, what does a day in my life look like? I spend a ton of time uh, over here, working on whiteboards with people, talking with talking through ideas with people, drawing different diagrams, trying different methodologies. I spend a bunch of time working with people, reviewing their code, talking about how they can improve their code, what they can do better. I spend a lot of time writing. Uh, in a, in a large organization where I've got 400 engineers that I have to work with, um, I can't just rely on talking to people to get it done. And so uh, I write papers, I write blog posts, I, I get out as much information as I can uh, so that people can understand what we're thinking about and how we're thinking about it so that they can be making good decisions in their code while they're writing. And lastly, uh, a couple times a month, I have to get up and present ideas to people. I have to take an idea that I've nurtured and written about and turn it into a presentation where I do a Q&A session and I talk through what, what my idea is like and, and why it's the right thing for us to do and why it's important for people to, to get behind the idea. Um, career evolution of a typical software engineer. Um, you start out as an intern and then as you level up, you go through the levels of software, senior software, uh, leader principal. Uh, as you start to transition over to the architect side, your technical skills become slightly less important than your people skills and your leadership skills. 
uh, as you go through architecture, while I don't manage lots and lots of people, I partner with someone who does. And so I have uh, what we call three in a box. I, there is a vice president of product management and his job is to figure out what should the business build from uh, a, what do we want to offer to our customer standpoint. And so he spends all of his time talking to our customers and really trying to figure out where the customers want to go. Oh, customers don't want to spend as much time doing the merchandising activities that that rank all of the results that that tell when you search for blue coat, this is the blue coat that's going to come up. So let's figure out a better way to do that. And he comes to me and says, I need you to think of a better way to do that. And then I think for a while about how it should be done. And I talk to a bunch of people and I talk to a bunch of the product managers and I talk to a bunch of the engineers and kind of bring people together. And, and then we write up, this is how it should be done. And then I come over to my partner, who's the VP of engineering. And the VP of engineering says, okay, I'm going to figure out a schedule for how we can arrange for enough people to work on this to get it done. And so I'm responsible for how do we build it? He's responsible for when does it get built? And so we, the three of us kind of partner and work over about a team of about 400. And so it, it's much, much more about the, the social skills that I've developed. I still have to have my technical skills because if I don't have my technical skills, I can't really tell people how something should be built because it won't make any sense. And so I have to work with others to make that happen. Um, keys to success in this industry, uh, self-directed. You gotta be able to be a self-starter. Customer focused, you need to understand the customer problems and make sure that you're always solving a customer problem. You need to be intellectually curious. You need to ask why something is and how. Have that beginner's mindset where you're always trying to learn something from, from every interaction that you have. Uh, you have to be methodical. If you don't have a deliberate, predictable practice, you won't have deliberate, predictable results and customers won't be happy. Lastly, to be happy at, at, as you grow as a programmer, you need to be a team player. One person churning out code can only ever do so much. We win as a team, and so we think of it as a team win. Um, when I was a scout, what were the skills that I took away from scouts that have helped me? Uh, leadership skills. You know, I, I was I, I held several positions in the venture crew. Last the last time I was in a venture crew, I was the venture crew president. Um, delegation and coaching. I had to learn how to let other people do jobs, set the parameters so that they know what they're doing and then check in with them, coach them, make sure that they're able to accomplish the goal without me micromanaging them, just giving them a goal and helping them achieve their goal as opposed to driving them. Um, project planning has been pretty important. I had to learn to do project planning as a scout and it has paid off in spades. I think uh, personal management and family life uh, are two of the most important merit badges because they teach you some of these critical skills. And then edge method. I spend a lot of time educating people on how to do things. And so striking that balance between I'm talking at you and I'm really engaging with you and enabling you to do the things that I'm envisioning uh, becomes pretty important. And so that that's that's about all that I've got for the the this section. So uh that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, while you were talking, we have some audience, um, some questions that were coming in. Um, uh, Cynthia, who's in the audience, she wanted to know, uh, she knows or understands that Salesforce does CRM as well. And then um, and then there's this, you know, e-commerce arm. What other arms do you folks do? Yeah, so Salesforce is pretty, pretty big at this point. Um, so our core products are uh, sales and service. Those are, those are the classic CRM products. Um, marketing. Uh, is another massive arm. So marketing uh, is, uh, I think, the second largest marketing platform. Um, we are commerce. Uh, a, in addition to us, there's a group called Tableau. Um, Tableau uh, are analytics. They they can help all kinds of businesses. Super awesome products there. Um, MuleSoft. 
uh, is our integration cloud product. It helps connect different systems together. Uh, Heroku is uh, kind of AWS made simple. Uh, so it, it's, it, it was actually one of the premier, uh, what we call platform as a service platforms. Um, they were one of the earliest movers, um, which, which is, is awesome and, and a great product to work with. Uh, Quip is another great uh, product that we have. It, it's kind of like a Google Google Docs kind of thing, but for businesses, um, it's it it has an awesome collaboration uh, mechanism. Um, th those are kind of the the big big ticket products that are you know um, hundreds of millions of dollars each in in revenue. How has how has coding and programming evolved uh, with the situation and, and the sophistication and everything with e-commerce? Have you seen a, a huge change? Yeah, I, so 20 years ago, everything was written very bespoke. Uh, everyone would code everything from the ground up. Uh, if you bought an e-commerce platform, your expectation was you were gonna spend nine to 12 months customizing it and creating it before you'd ever bring your site live. Uh, today, we're, we're working increasingly towards um, two different ends at the same time. So we have the concept of headless commerce, where it's all just APIs, and you build whatever you want in front of APIs. And, and that's pretty popular in the up market, uh, where you've got sophisticated people. So like an Under Armour, or an uh, Adidas, um, or a Hudson Bay Company, they are they have as many professional programmers as a software company and they, they do some really cool work and they want to control their brand experience and so they they control the front end and they use us as a platform that you would never know under the covers on the flip side of it we have a bunch of customers who are a little bit more focused on look we're we want to be able to sell quickly but we're not really like it's not really our bag to be technologists. We care about our brands, but we want to go click, click, click. We want our merchandisers to rule. We don't want developers to rule. And so those businesses, um, we build them what we call metadata-driven systems or, or configurable systems where we, we hand them a bunch of tools that let them drag elements around on a screen and hook things up with, with uh, flows and little snippets of code that maybe even they've downloaded from a partner. Um, so we have a bunch of partners. One of one of the strengths of Salesforce is the partner ecosystem, where there's a whole bunch of little companies that are even big companies that partner with us and build little code snippets to help accelerate customers. And so customers, just like apps off the app store, customers can grab um, little code snippets off our, our, our little packages off of our uh, app exchange they can install them and run them in their sites, and it's all just a, a clicks, not code experience. Thanks. Um, what was I, I know how you mentioned um, uh, the um, how uh, I'm trying to think of how Verizon used your product uh, during 9/11 to help redirect traffic. What yeah. I mean, that, I think that's great. But has there any has there been like another huge, crazy, very exciting program that you've been involved in, or in your opinion? Or like a really um, large, interesting one. Uh, so, uh, so it's uh, at, at almost every company. There's been something kind of kind of cool and interesting. Uh, the 9/11 one just sort of spoke to me personally because uh, right. it, yeah. it it was so personally gratifying. Uh, at Sophos, one of the really cool things is um, we had invented uh, uh, a technology that could block crypto jacking. Uh, so all of these attacks where someone takes over your computer and then puts up a ransom. Um, it was really cool to see that roll out into, in, we, we launched it just in time before that big wave of crypto jacking attacks happened. And so it was really gratifying to hear our customers come back to us and say, we know that you project, protected us here. We've got the logs that show that, you know, these attacks were attempted against us and your software blocked it. Um, that, that was pretty cool. Um, it's been really interesting. The exciting part of this commerce cloud is uh, just the level of brands that that I get to interact with. Like watching Disney run the May the Fourth sale was just like I, I can't believe I'm working on this. You know, it's it, and we have this incredible operations team, and 
you know, you might have seen a flash of Slack up on, on my screen when I was uh, minimizing. Uh, they do Slack ops like I've never seen before. Like there is there is so much coordination. All of these brand sites, all of them high value. You know, watching flash sales running. The you know we we know when our largest vendors are running their sales and people are are really caring about these customers and paying hyper attention to them. Uh, watching how traffic mounts. Watching when we block a bot and and the the site performance immediately picks up. Like it's it's kind of cool to to watch this. It's it's a lot of fun. Thanks. Um, we're coming up towards the end of our time. What kind of advice would you give any young person or anybody who would be um, interested in your career path? Um, number one, uh, practice asking why. Always <laughs> be asking, why am I doing this? Like if, if a lot of programmers get started and don't understand why they're doing anything and they just assume it'll go. Um, it, you always want to back it up and ask why and really understand that deeper you know, why did this work? Why didn't that work? Like that that intellectual curiosity is important to improve. Uh, it takes 10,000 hours of programming to be at the level of a principal programmer. Um, and so you really wanna, and, and that's not just wrote, I'm writing code. It's the, I'm thinking about it. I'm really understanding what I'm doing. I'm really understanding why. And so spending that time really introspecting and asking those questions i think is the number one thing that you can do great well thank you so much for coming out and doing this chris this has uh, been been very educational and it's funny like i think about like all the stuff that you do and when we see a product we don't think about all the people behind the scenes and then even your position is behind the scenes behind the scenes yeah so um well thanks for making all these brands go and, and for making the world spin <laughs> Thanks a lot. Have a good afternoon. Bye.